32 core monster, 64 gigabytes of RAM. I can only be talking about the Threadripper 990WX, right? Nope. <laughs> this is epic. <laughs> EPYC, but you knew that from the title already. See, my jokes, they're really bad, but that's okay because you're not here for the jokes. You're here for the lowdown. I've done something kind of unholy. So we've got the Epic, the AMD Epic 7551P, which is a CPU that I'm going to be talking a lot about, I think, for the next couple of months. See, we did that testing thing with the Threadripper 2990WX, which is a monster CPU. It behaves weird on Windows with some workloads, like there are performance regressions where the 2990 will actually perform slower than the 2950X, another Threadripper CPU from, from AMD. 16 cores versus 32 cores. Now the 2990 is no slouch. There's not anything wrong with the processor, but something has been eating at the back of my mind. Something that I've been trying to figure out. Why is it slower on Windows? Now Linux doesn't suffer from this problem. And uh, we, we ran benchmarks like the Indigo benchmark, a 3D rendering benchmark, which multiple cores, many cores, you know, 32 cores, is particularly well suited for scaling up. Now, a lot of things don't really scale the more CPUs that you add. When you double the number of CPUs, you might only get, you know, 25 to 50% scaling. So moving from one core to four cores, well, that's a pretty big deal, but moving from four cores to 32 cores proportionally, you're not really gaining as much in most applications. Now that's not really true of server workloads where things have been parallel for a long time. I mean, if you have a lot of clients accessing the server, you know, a web server with a lot of users connecting and downloading a lot of resources, that scales a lot better than a desktop computer. And so that's what, you know, AMD was sort of designing for with many cores and the whole chiplets thing and their epic server CPUs. And Threadripper is really just sort of repurposed epic cpus for the desktop but the threadripper cpus are also clocked higher they use more power one big difference is the threadripper cpus only have half as many memory channels and we'll talk a little bit more about that but it was sort of eating me like why is there this performance regression on windows and i think to answer that question i need a 32 core 64 thread cpu well it just so happens that amd has the 7551p so the P, the difference between the P and the non-P processor is that with Threadripper, you can only run motherboards that have one socket. So with Epic, we're talking about two sockets in a computer and you could run two physical CPUs. So 64 threads plus 64 threads, 128 threads in a box. Well, those CPUs, the 7551 is a $5,000 processor, but the 7551P, that's a $2,500 processor. And the reason that it costs less is because it'll only work in single socket motherboards and also partly market forces because there are a lot of people that have workloads that'll scale kind of well to a point and then after that they don't really scale as well. There's also a big market for consolidation. So you have a server, like say, I don't know, a Xeon E5, you know, 2670 or a bunch of them and you want to start consolidating them. Well, I just so happen to have a, a super micro. Uh, well, actually I think that's an eight, that's a, well, there's a Franken server behind me, but it's a, it's a Xeon E5 2670. You can consolidate four of these, four of these dual socket 2U servers, the workload, the virtual machines, Linux box, Windows, Mix, whatever. You can easily, easily consolidate four of these into a single socket 7551P. That is extremely impressive. And that is another conversation that I wanna have around the 7551 Epic CPU because if you have a lot of legacy servers or older servers and you're looking to consolidate them, and I told you, like I just came along as like a salesperson and said, hey, a lot of those you know, first and second gen Xeons, maybe even some of the third gen Xeons, uh, you could take three or four of those boxes, consolidate those onto a single socket box and still have room left over to grow. I would tell the, to, I mean, I would think that you were a crazy person or you were just trying to sell me snake oil or something. But this platform is so impressive. 32 cores, 64 threads, support for up to two terabytes of memory. It really is mind blowing. Now I'm not suggesting that you build your server as I have, and I'm not even suggesting this for a, an Epic workstation, but it's good for me because I can do my experiments. And of course, what chariot 
is carrying my 7551P? Well, it's the Gigabyte MZ01-CE0. Yes, I mean, not the most original motherboard name ever, but it has eight channels, so it supports the full eight channels of memory um, from Epic. That's one DIMM per channel. Server motherboards that are physically larger will support two DIMMs per channel. Uh, it does support up to like 200, 250 watts of power from the VRM, like if you just do the math on the VRM, but officially those Epic CPUs are only rated at up to 180 watts, plus or minus. So 180 watt Epic CPUs, that's another difference with Threadripper, you know, Threadripper, we've pushed the 2990 to 400 watts, and as long as you can manage the heat, uh, it works really well. But for data center customers, there's not a data center customer on earth, really, that is looking for a 400 watt server CPU. If that's what they have to deal with, they'll take it but they don't want a 400 watt server CPU. They want a power efficient, the most compute per dollar, compute per dollar, compute per dollar energy costs, all this kind of stuff. So that's what AMD has been targeting. And so the Epic CPU will run at two to three gigahertz. Now the Gigabyte motherboard here is really a server motherboard. It's designed for a rack mount chassis. And if you're gonna do this, you probably should use some rack mount com components. But with all those disclaimers aside, let me walk you through the workstation that I built because I like it and it works for me. First up, we've got the Gigabyte motherboard that I mentioned before. I'll tell you some more of the features. It's got a ton of four pin fan headers so you can configure all of the fans. I'm running that in a Fractal Define R6. And again, with a lot of fans, I don't even have closed loop or custom custom loop water cooling because you don't need it because it doesn't run really super hot. I mean, that CPU is gonna consume at most around 180 watts, but there you go. It has four USB three ports, two on the front panel connection, two on the, on the back. The way that the uh, USB 3.0 header comes off of this is at a right angle. And so it will work even in a 1U rack mount case. If you've got a 1U rack mount case, you could totally run 1U with this motherboard. Although I'd recommend 2U for, for ample cooling. I'm running it with a deep cool Gamer Storm Threadripper CPU cooler. Why that? Well, that particular TR4 cooler, it's really designed for Threadripper, will work great in a 4U rack mount case. Now it's turned 90 degrees. The Epic sockets on the motherboard in general are turned 90 degrees. And so the airflow might not make sense in a rack mount case, but for my Fractal Define R6, it makes perfect sense because I've got the top configured as a vent. And so I could just draw the warm air out the top. It works great, it's a good setup. So with this case, I've got my fans configured to bring air in from the front and the bottom and to exhaust air at the rear and the top. And that has worked really well in all of my testing and workloads and, and that sort of thing. Also in this system, I'm running a, an NVMe, like a, a breakout NVMe by four slot. The slot configuration on this motherboard is all four slots run it by 16. There's also a physical by eight slot and that runs at the full by eight because with that 7551P, I've got 128 PCI Express lanes. I've got PCI Express lanes for days. And I'm not even using them all. Also on board, we have uh, 16 SATA connections. Now it's not SAS, it doesn't have a SAS controller or a RAID controller or anything like that, but you have um, four of the micro connectors that will break out into SATA cables. So if you wanted to use a, an inexpensive case like the Norco 4020 uh, or one of the Chenbro cases that uh, does not have a SAS expander built in, that's just SATA, you can totally use that. But I strongly recommend, even for a testing system or even for, for a standby system, unless you're gonna build out a bunch of these, I strongly recommend a SAS controller with a multiplexing backplane so that you have a redundant path to each set of disks rather than SATA. I mean, you can use it if it's like a backup appliance or something like that, but anything that's mission critical, I'm gonna strongly suggest that you get something that at least has the uh, multi-path, you know, a multiplexer backplane thingy so that you can have multiple paths through the controller. You get an LSI controller added in, basically you're done. Uh, the motherboard power connectors on this are also right angle at the front edge of the board with an auxiliary 12 volt connector, not at a right angle on the top left of the board. But again, using a desktop power supply and a desktop interface, no problem. Gigabyte also breaks out the motherboard identification button, like you hit a button and it flashes a light, which is actually handy when you've got a rack full of these in rack mount cases because a light will blink on the front and back of the chassis so that you can identify a server in the rack. So let's, let's say that you've got a rack of like 40 of these that are one U. One of them is acting up, you remote into it, you know it's IP address, don't know where it is in the rack. You can in the IPMI configure it to blink. And speaking of IPMI, it's the A-Speed AST 2500. It's 
built in. It's got built in VGA so that you can control it remotely. You don't have to use that. It works great with add in PCI Express cards. This platform also supports four Tesla V100s. No problem. So if you wanted to build the ultimate Tesla box for testing or whatever, this platform is going to support it. And it's going to do it even in this fractal define R6 case, not even a rack mount case. Other stuff that's really exciting about this Gigabot motherboard that I've been using is that it has a lot of options in the UEFI, like more than you would expect from an Epic motherboard. In addition to being able to configure all of the PCI Express slots to be whatever lane configuration you want. So you could literally take all four by 16 slots and split all of them into four by four connections. So four, eight, 16 by four connections plus the by eight will split as well. So if you wanted to break those by 16 slots, out into U.2 adapters to go with a U.2 chassis. Those are pretty rare, but the, the manufacturing for those is ramping up. Gigabot is also gonna offer some chassis around this motherboard with a lot of really cool options, and I can't, can't wait to dive into those, but you've got some options in terms of configuration, breaking your card out, and doing some other really exciting things. I've also tested this with Intel Optane, which may sound sacrilegious, but Intel Optane, I mean, it's, it's not a bad product. It's just Intel doesn't understand how to market it and who the customers are, I think, probably. I don't know, it's really baffling. But PCI Express Optane runs great. Infinity Fabric stuff runs great. Other UEFI options for doing cool stuff is that it has two built-in Intel uh, 10 gig ethernet interface, so that's the X550. You can configure the VLAN, you can do iSCSI booting directly from UEFI, works great. Now in terms of performance, mind-blowing, utterly mind-blowing. One of the reasons for that is in the UEFI, you can configure the TDP. Now you can down configure it, you know, if 180 watts is like, oh, we're gonna, we got a fleet of these, I don't ever want them to go over 150 because legacy replacement or whatever, you can do that in the UEFI, you can configure the, the CD, CTDP, you've got the Zen common options, the same stuff that you might be used to from the Threadripper side of things, or if you're just getting into this whole AMD thing, you can configure a lot of options on the CPU in term, in, including like how it does non-uniform memory access because you know, this is an Epic and potentially you have memory channels all over the place for all of your different dies. You can configure that. Ton of options in the UEF5 for configuring all of that stuff. Uh, you also can configure the memory. Now officially 2666 with one DIMM per channel is what Epic is designed for. It'll run at 3200 and you can configure that in the Gigabyte UEF5. Now not supported, no warranty. It's not, not a supported configuration. You can't, can't really do that. Voltage. Configuring the voltage for the memory, that's maybe something that you should consider when you do that, but you can run it at up to 3200 uh, by configuring that in the UEFI. The motherboard also does have one onboard M.2 slot, and the M.2 slot has a very cleverly placed uh, temperature sensor. There's actually a little block of foam and a little uh, you know, flex wire temperature sensor, so it will actually match the temperature sensor into your M.2, and that will be monitored for temperature. So again, if you're gonna run this in a rack mount configuration or something like that, it's nice to have because it'll ramp the fans if that M.2 starts to get a little warm. So good job, Gigabyte. Now in terms of supported operating systems and you know it's the software story and that kind of thing, I've been running Fedora on it. Fedora runs great. Ubuntu has also been heavily tested. I've got the IOMMU group separation, which is pretty good. It's about what you'd expect. I mean, it's a server platform, so it's gonna be a little bit better than the desktop in general, and there's no chipset, so. Everything works really great. You can do a lot of really fun stuff with this. I'd love to do a PCI Express breakout because I think this would be one of the easiest ways to do uh, you know, a whole bunch of virtual machines for an individual with a whole bunch of different peripherals versus something like SRIOV or, or something like that because you can literally, each, each of the 16 slots will split into four slots so you could potentially have 16 PCI Express by four slots dedicated to the CPU with no bridges or muxes or anything. So if you had a chassis to do that in, well, that would be really something just for experiment time. I'm rambling, doesn't have anything to do with what you're interested in probably, so let's, let's move on. In terms of like, you know, quality of life, nice things to have, the motherboard has headers for the, the uh, uh, you know, system management bus headers and things like that. So if you've got a smart power supply, or you're connecting to a chassis that has like a managed back plane for drive identification, all that kind of stuff. The motherboard comes with a little breakout cable to be able to do that with a standard, you know, the standard like five pin interface. Um, that's pretty well supported. It also has a socketed BIOS, so you could remove the BIOS chip and replace it if something goes wrong. And it also has a socketed IPMI 
controller thing. So like if you're super paranoid and don't even want the IPMI, you can remove it, disable it. No IPMI works fine. But the IPMI on this motherboard is one of the best modern IPMIs. I mean, the A-speed IPMI is it's HTML5. It works great in Chrome. It works great in Firefox. You can do your operating system installation for it remotely. It works pretty well even when you've got an add-in graphics card and you need to do basic system management. You can upgrade the firmware. You can upgrade the baseband management controller firmware through the IPMI. The IPMI is really full featured. You can get a lot of information out of it. There are provisions and options for reading other sensor data from other stuff on the system management bus but getting a little bit too much in the weeds there. It's a really solid, well put together server motherboard. Now I happen to be using it in the workstation because I'm a crazy person and it works fine and the system is like whisper quiet and great and I'm using a, a gamer CPU cooler but again that CPU cooler will fit great in 4U. It's one of a very, very few TR4 coolers that doesn't block the RAM at all and can be used in a 4U rack mount case. Trust me, that's actually hard to find. And that's the Deep Cool, it's the Fryzen uh, cooler from Deep Cool. There's a link to it in the description. So I've been doing some fun things with this, got some benchmarks for this. And uh, back to the original question that I had is, what does Indigo do? Well, Indigo runs correctly on this platform under Windows. I, I can get a score of about three, um, which is a little bit better than a Pentium Gold 6130 on Windows, it's about this is like that's like 2.7 to depends on your OEM and what they've configured on the power, but it's a 2.7 to like 3.02, 3.1 with the Pentium Gold 6130. So the 7551 for Indigo is about equivalent to 6130, 6140. So the 7551 is a mind blowing processor, and the MZ01-CE0 is a brilliant motherboard to run it in from Gigabyte. No RGB, no BS, no frills, just a solid motherboard to be able to run that processor and do whatever you need. And I'm doing it in a desktop case, which is a little off label, but it works. It works great, it works great for my use case. And I'm having a blast. And so we've got some more content in store for the whole Threadripper 2990 versus the 7551. And it's not really a versus, it's a let's compare the two to see if we can figure out why Windows is having such a hard time managing 32 cores and 64 threads on that Threadripper 2990 when the 7551 does such a better job. Adventures in NUMA, that's level one. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one text forums. If you wanna like run a workload, it's like, hey, will my workload consolidate for this? And we can somehow get it to some kind of a package that I can run, come to the level one forums, let's do it. Why not, I don't know, I mean, I got time, let's make it happen. Wendell, I'm signing out, I'll see you there.